and, and that's how they got that packed house. I will say the highway scene is completely, there's no one there, which is kind of bonkers. No one on that yeah. highway because they had to lock it off. But I liked the amount of extras in, in quote unquote, Detroit. I think they did a really good job loading that up with fans. I mean, it looked good. And, no, no. There was a, and I was doing a Night of the Comet podcast, and the director said, all you need are a couple wides establishing an empty LA, or just all you need are a couple wides, and everyone will buy this world. And in this, they had a couple wides with tons of people, and mm -hmm. you, you kind of buy the vibe of it. So I, I dug oh, yeah. that about it. I Never once did I think I, – it looked like they were going to a – the best they could, a concert, I would say. Yeah, and I, I really liked how the, when we're going into the show, at the, I think it's at the 40-minute mark, that you're really seeing you know Kiss lit up, and it looks like you how you would when you were a kid. You're seeing all these people all over the place. You see the people in the demon's makeup. You know, it just it, – it looks so good, and it looks like how you would imagine a teenager – you know, would would think when they go to see this show. I I think it was done perfect. No, I I, I agree. They they captured the the excitement of it. And I dug it, and I think this is why I have a question, Chris. Why do you think this movie has a cult audience now? What do you think it is about it that people seem to like? I think it it's. I would like to go with what uh, I think it was Giuseppe said about the no. You know what? It wasn't Giuseppe. It was uh, Sam said in the commentary, and I agree with this. Is that this movie is relatable not just for KISS fans, it's for everybody in general. That no matter what kind of music you like, you can relate to this. So I, I think of it like that. And this movie reminds you of what it was like to be a teenager at the time, or in general. Like I, this, this movie reminds me a lot of whenever I was a kid. And uh, well, it came out whenever I was 15, so I was kind of like around their age in the movie. It reminds me of that, of the time and how, how would it felt like to listen to the music and to you know, ha have friends and listening and jamming out and to, and whatnot. I just, I, that's what I like about it. And I think it's relatable to, for people from all ages. And that's what really stuck with me. You know, it has a 48% tomato meter score. Uh, would you say that's about right? Or what, what, what would you give for this film? No, I give this easily 80%. Really? It's a fun oh gosh, yeah. It's a fun story. I, I know I know that on IMDB it gets a six point nine meta score of thirty-three. As you said, Rotten Tomatoes forty-eight, and with the audience we have it at eighty-two, which is what I agree with. I think it's a lot of fun. It's not it's not a movie that you can take seriously, that everything about it, it has to be accurate, although it is accurate with the with the props. Okay. I think that it's just a fun movie that people can just kind of turn on in the background. You like the music no matter what what decade it is. And it's just a lot of fun for you to just turn off and just tune in. Uh, what other uh, notes do you got for us, Chris Kelly, here, before we get oh. into your recommendation? Um, I just have a few here. Jonathan Taylor Thomas was originally supposed to be in this movie. Uh, he was actually contacted by Gene Simmons personally, but he ultimately wound up going to college. Um, according to reports, Jonathan Taylor Thomas wanted to be either Jam or Hawk. You know what's interesting is that the director's like, I'm glad you didn't do it. Right, right. Then the director say it worked out for the better that he didn't do it. Yeah, I, I think I think what I agree with what he said. The star power of Jonathan Taylor Thomas would have hurt the movie, whereas people wouldn't have seen it. Well, I mean, people didn't see it anyways, but I don't think that it would have lasted as long as it would have had it had Jonathan Taylor Thomas. And it wouldn't have been looking at it in the future. People would have looked at it and just said, oh, that guy, he's he, he's trying to make a quick buck. This is part of his in his movie career where he was just kind of yada yada things. I like your, I like your yada yadas today. You've, we've yada 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 a few things. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I've been showing my girlfriend, um, uh, Seinfeld. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, uh, the show is still damn funny. I'm telling you, but there's a lot of yadas. <laughs> <laughs> what are the no What are the fun things you got for us? So, uh, according to the commentary, Gene Simmons, that, uh, Gene Simmons said that he wanted Kiss to be, quote, the Beatles on steroids, end quote. And what he meant by that was he wanted people to like a certain band member or the whole band in general, but he wanted to have fans to gravitate towards one uh, band member and really like that one. And you you do find that with people who are fans of the Beatles. They, there's Ringo people, there's Paul people, and there's John people. You get the idea. Yeah. And the same thing can be said with Kiss. It's a people, there's Peter people, there's 
gene people and et cetera, et cetera. And depending on who you gravitate towards, he gave them, he wanted them all to have their own personalities, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, Kiss is also the first band to ever have a 3D live show. Now that sounds a little ridiculous, but because wouldn't it be 3D anyways, because you're at the show, it's actually 4D because you're in reality. However, no one's ever had a projection behind the band that was in 3D. So it was like a triple concert at the same time, which is nuts if you think about it. Wow. He is definitely not a fan of disco. He, uh, if you listen to the commentary, he goes on about a good five minute rant about how he hates disco and about how no one remembers any of the disco bands and you only remember one specifically. But other than that, you cannot name anyone else. And I was, I was thinking about it and I was like, he's right. You really can't think of anyone other than the Bee Gees. Didn't they put out a little bit of a disco song, though, years later? They after did. The, yeah. They did uh, in 1979, I Was Made For Loving You, which is, was their biggest hit, quote-unquote biggest hit, depending on who you're talking to. I don't really like that song all that much. I've never been a big fan of that song. Um, I've, I've always liked the Destroyer album, so I can't really say much about it. Uh, I also loved Groom Service was always my favorite song. But what's your favorite Kiss song? Oh, geez, Louise. <sighs> I don't know, rock and roll all night. I think, okay, all right, okay. So here's the thing. It's super basic, but it's just such, I mean, it makes sense. I'm, I just want to rock and roll all night and party every day. I, just, I don't know. And also I love <laughs> when they talk about it in Role Models, which I love. is a very Kiss, which a movie, like Paul, Sean William Scott and Paul Rudd love Kiss in that movie. But I just yeah. kind of, I want to party, but I want to party all night and party some of every day. I don't know. I, so that's got to be it. Super basic. I mean, it's a classic for a reason. And it's such a great arena song, and it's such a, a smart business move to make a song called Rock and Roll All Night. Oh, yeah. I like in uh, Days of Confused, whenever they did the 1994 remix, and you see uh, Amelia uh, jo Jovovich driving down the road, and they have the two statues in the back of their car with the kiss makeup. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm... It's, a, it's a good, it's a good, that's a solid choice. I, should, I shouldn't have grunted. Yeah, you, was... you laid out a, you were like, oh, man. <laughs> He just took my belt buckle. Chris Bully Kelly. <laughs> Listen, I like songs. Maybe maybe I'm talking cynically here, but I think when you are able, like, you, know, you think about Queen and some of their arena rock, and you think about Kiss, I think there is a place for songs that are meant for massive arenas with readily available lyrics. It just seems oh, that's that's why I like it. Like I think it's I think it's a smart smart song. If you're in the heyday of your career or you're looking to get started, rock and roll all night. Shoot, easy to sing. Yeah, keep going, keep going, man. I I love I, I like I like Kiss. I'm not a massive Kiss fan, but I do like Kiss. Uh, I've always enjoyed their music, and I used to collect their Psycho Circus uh, comic books when they were re-released in the '90s. I don't think I have them anymore, but I, I used to I used to collect those when they first came out. So I, I like the makeup. I like the theatrics. I think it's cool. So I just want to add that uh, uh, the band members of KISS don't consider this a KISS movie. They consider it a movie about KISS fans going to see KISS. So oh, I think that's yeah. fair. So it's, I mean, it, it isn't a KISS movie at all, but they were really happy to actually go on a film set that was very well organized and not like Phantom of the Park. <laughs> oh, that was bad. Oh, man. I don't know if you can get any worse than that movie. <laughs> Do you like role models? Hell yeah. I showed that one to Miriam actually not that long ago. She loved it, too. We should I talk about it movie. soon. Oh, man. I, I'd love to. Oh, my God. <laughs> I right. love that movie. Let's do so it. So darn good. Oh, man. I love that. Well, the, the, the little kid in that. He goes, he's like, what do you listen to this music with these, these guys that are dressed like girls and they wear makeup? And he's like, that's Kiss. And then he plays Love Gun for yeah. me. He's like, he's talking about his, you know, and it's like, oh, geez. So he's like, all their songs are about uh, hot chicks. <laughs> it's so true. It really is. All their songs are quite literally about that. It makes it even more fun. And then they go LARPing as Kiss, which I love. Yeah, yeah. They, they, that's their, that's their, that's their uh, country that they created. All right, we'll save it for the next app. How's that sound? Oh, hell yeah. I'm down. Um, I, I do want to add one quick, one quick thing. Uh, there's just two little things of a uh, um, trivia that I'd like to just add. Uh, the film does take place in 1978, and at the time, Kiss was on their Alive 2, which they were in Detroit on January 21st and 23rd. Detroit Rock City was actually part of their encore list, not their starting song. Hey, so, that's uh, fun. Which is a neat little thing that you could have added, uh, that, that was added. I'm sure they may have, when they went to Detroit, they, they did perform Detroit Rock City first, but part of their actual set list 
which you can look this up online. Uh, that was part of their encores. Um, the KISS tickets that are burned cost $5.50, which would have been a roughly, well, no, not roughly, exactly $21.63 today. Wow. That's not, uh, that's not, that's not expensive. That's really not expensive at all, because I think their tickets are probably about 100 bucks now. Oh, yeah. Those things are um, jacked up. This movie was hit and miss, mainly miss with the critics. Uh, just to be honest, I want to read just a couple of things from critics before we, before I jump into my uh, recommendations. The article written by Janet Maislin for the New York Times, uh, the article called Detroit Rock City, A Weakness for Rockers and Ghoul. She said, with one of the worst films in recent years already to his credit, and she's talking about the dark backward uh, in which Judd Nelson grows a third arm between his shoulder blades. Director Adam Rifkin aims for two in this weary promotional. She was not a big fan of this movie. And Adam Glieberman was also not a big fan of this movie. He wrote in his article, I grew up in Michigan in the 70s, and I was also primed to see Detroit Rock City. Uh, it's a rowdy B-movie homage to the tongue-waggling, moon-booted, power cord wheeling band Kiss. Mostly, it's about the crazed devotion they inspired. The movie, I'm afraid, isn't going to inspire much devotion. That's because it sucks. <laughs> and here's my reasons why. <laughs> I love it. That's so blunt. <laughs> and he goes and he, I'm not going to read the rest of his article, but if, if anyone out there wants to look it up, he is very brutally honest about why he hated this movie. But to counter that, Nick LaSalle liked it. In his article, uh, written, The Trot Brick City is way cool, man. He said... There's a beautifully shot scene in which the guys drive near the concert arena as the street fills with fans. The word kiss flashes in electric lights. By shooting the street through the windshield, Rifkin helps adults remember how a rock concert is perceived through their teenage eyes. It's huge, and the city feels enchanted and Audrey in the nicest way. Aww. And I like that. I thought, I, I thought that was very fitting. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. And I, I don't, I don't get how people didn't like this movie, but it could have been the timing. It could have been because Boogie Nights really did blow out the planet with uh, their '70s and how raw it was. And there's also no, so you think about American Pie. There's more of a like a female presence in that. In this one, it's just kind of four dudes who are going to a Kiss concert. So I think it might have alienated other people from going and watching it. There's no real love story. There's no, there's a little bit of coming of age, but I think that's maybe another thing that probably kept it from being too big. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, the coming of age isn't really present. The love story is just kind of a supporting character, which really isn't even that good to begin with because we really don't know much about Beth. So mm -hmm. it's like... But I did like the little cheeky nods that they're the uh, Christine and Beth, which are named after famous Kiss Kiss songs. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, recommendations by Chris Kelly. <laughs> Here we go, guys. <laughs> Can I get my theme music? Chris Kelly recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> Love God. <laughs> you know what that song's about? <laughs> oh man. Oh man, look up Room Service when I heard that song. That actually, that song actually is on their tape, Dressed to Kill. Uh, sorry, their album, Dressed to Kill. And it's, that, that song's played, and then rock, I think it's Rock and Roll All Night and Party Every Day is next. <laughs> so anyways, my recommendations. Because the movie does take place in the 70s, in the, in the 1990s, there was a hard nostalgia for the 1970s. Much like nowadays, there's a hard nostalgia for the 1990s. And then of course, in another 10 or 15 years, there's going to be a massive nostalgia for the 20s, uh, the 2000s, and 2010s. So during this time, there was a lot of movies that came out. I can't name all of them, obviously. But one of them that really stuck out, other than Detroit Rock City, was a movie that was based on a very real crime that happened that in many ways affected many people in the entertainment industry and over the years have really hasn't gotten a lot of notor hasn't been recognized over the years. And that movie is, of course, Wonderland. Ooh. That is a phenomenal film starring Val Kilmer as John C. Holmes. Yeah. And you can take a wild guess as to what the C stands for. He's a famous porn star. And it's all about his drug addiction and about how he teamed up with mobsters and the whole murders that happened on, one, on Wonderland. And it's amazing. We see Ted Levine playing uh, one of the best police officers ever. He has one of the best quotes, which I've said numerous times. Um, if Mark, Mark, if you're okay with me doing the PG-13, I'd love to say his quote. Yeah, do it. He says, they find fingerprints on the back of Eddie, Na Eddie Nash's bed frame, 
And they, they say, the police officers say, well, how did his fingerprints get there? Ted Levine says, well, he was either fighting them or fucking them. 